welcome to Sweden. Home of Norma Ammunition. Started over 120 years ago in the small town of Amatfors, the company originally produced ammunition for the military. But by the 1960s was exporting top quality hunting ammunition across the globe. Nowadays, the factory boasts an output of 60 million projectiles, 120 million cases, and 75 million complete cartridges a year. All in over 110 different calibers, making nearly everything from scratch on site. I've been shooting rifles for quite some time and buying ammunition to shoot with them. Never once have I given thought to how those bullets came into existence. When somebody asked me how it was made, I had absolutely no idea. So here we are at Norma in Sweden to find out. We were given access to learn about the processes that turned these raw materials into some of the world's finest rifle ammunition. I was educated on what different projectiles are designed for. And of course, how could I come to an ammo factory and not fire some inappropriately big guns? Welcome to the Norma factory. Let's get straight into the manufacturing process starting with the construction of the traditional copper-jacketed lead core bullet. Up until a few hours ago, I had no idea how this worked. It's been a real education. A bullet starts its life like this. This is a copper cup. They live in this hopper, it travels up this conveyor, and it's processed one batch at a time into this little machine. This picks them up, puts them the right way around, and then feeds them into a press. That press takes this cup, and draws it out. That turns this into this in one process. It's now about the right width and the right sort of length. From there, they're taken onto the next machine. All of these oversized copper cups travel up this conveyor, down a pipe, and into this machine where they're parted off at the correct length. All of the waste gets kicked out of the side and all of those cups that are now the right length travel up this pipe. Now this uneven piece has been cut into the perfect length. However, the cutter puts a taper at the end and so it goes through another process where it's flared out, ready to accept the lead core. Now we have a copper cup, it's time to make a lead core to go inside it. Every caliber has its own starting wire so that it minimizes waste. That's dragged up into this machine and run through a sizer. The waste goes one way, the lead has a slight freefall and is dropped onto this conveyor belt. That travels up a conveyor, down into a grading system once it's made sure that each batch is correct, up into another conveyor to meet the copper cup. In this hopper, we have copper cups. In this hopper, we have lead cores. They come down two pipes and are joined together so. This then goes through six sizing dies that turns this lead-filled copper cylinder into the conical bullet shape we are so familiar with. This is a soft point. And as such, it's pretty much done now. If it was a ballistic tip, it would go to another machine that would just press ballistic tips into these heads. All of this may seem small scale to you because in reality it is. There are a lot of small scale operations because Norma produces so many different calibers and so many different types of bullet for each caliber. For the more common stuff, they're not doing it like this. They use a modern automated loading machines. Let's check one of them out right now. So these types of machines manufacture the common calibers and weights that Norma produce. It starts with two hoppers, one filled with copper cups and one with lead cores. 
these lead cores are cut for the exact caliber and bullet weight required. These are fed into the loading machine and go through 15 different processes before a bullet comes out the other end. This machine is actually no faster than that one we saw over there. That's capable of doing 18 to 20,000 a shift, an eight hour shift. This is two. The ballistic tip is what slows that process down. If this machine was making FMJs like the one behind it, that would be doing 35,000 every eight hours. It's a serious operation. Next, I was shown the process for manufacturing bonded bullets. These types of projectile actually bond the copper jacket and lead core to increase weight retention on impact. Like a normal bullet, the process starts with a lead core and an extruded copper jacket. After that, both go and get washed, and this is the, where it starts to get a little bit different. This really starts to slow the process down, which starts to explain to me why perhaps bonded bullets are a bit more expensive. After that, they drop into the next machine through two conveyors. The case is primed with a special liquid, and then the core is put in place. It's then dropped onto a conveyor, where it is heated up and that lead core is actually melted into the case, creating a bond. Pretty cool, eh? Otherwise, they're just pressure fitted. In this case, they're actually melted together or the lead core is melted into the case. From there, they go into another machine where it's shaped much like the others, but it gives you, as we're gonna find out later, hopefully, a slightly different result when that bullet impacts an animal. So that was bullets. Now it's time to look at the other side of the factory, where they produce the cases. Welcome to Case Production, where they turn 120 million of these into 120 million cases a year. It's noisy. Let's roll voiceover. Norma buy in these brass cups, and the first step is to anneal them. Annealing is the process of heating metal and allowing it to cool down slowly. This removes internal stresses, softens the metal and makes it easier to work. After this, the first drag is carried out and then the second. After size 2, it's become very hard. The more you work metal, the harder it gets and so they have to anneal it again. After second annealing, the brass gets its final stretch, is trimmed to size, and now it's time to start forming it into a case shape. Now it's cut to size, they put it in the bottom press. That creates a flat bottom, a primer pocket, and puts the name and caliber on there. The case is then annealed once more, ready for a process that tapers the case to size, forms the neck and creates the primer hole, before it goes to the next machine and is trimmed to length. Once that's done, the rim is turned into the case. This machine is actually washing and degreasing the cases. They come out of there into here, up the elevator, to one final annealing. At this point, it's cut to length, everything is solid, it's got a rim cut into it. It is a brass case. And to make sure it is pleasant to look at, polish it. Before, quality control. Here, every single case is checked for consistency and quality. Everything that doesn't meet that exacting standard is discarded. Right there is case manufacture. All of the completed cases are brought into this room and stacked up caliber by caliber, box by box. Behind me is bullet manufacture. They're brought in from there and stored in the next rack. When an order comes in or when these guys need to run a batch, they take the right case, the right head, they bring them together, stick them together in the room next door. The first step of loading is priming the cases. 
The primer is the part of the cartridge that, when hit by the firing pin, starts the ignition process. Usually by crushing a small amount of explosive compound between the primer cup and an internal piece of metal called an anvil. This small explosion sets fire to the powder and sends the bullet flying. From here, depending on the batch size, there's a few different loading sequences. But generally speaking, the process involves two major stages. Firstly, adding the appropriate type and quantity of powder, and secondly, adding the correct projectile. We fill this machine here that you can see with the bullets and then with prime cases, and from the roof comes powder. From heaven. From heaven. And then it goes, all these three components into this machine, we assemble it, and out it comes. You just set it up to your recipe, yeah. job done. Yeah. After this, the completed pieces of ammunition head over to be packed before being distributed all over the world. Aki, we've been around the factory today and it is bigger than I thought it would be. 75 million complete pieces of ammunition a year. And we can do even more. That's wild. It's really something. I, I have to say the, the factory, well, it's a big one and it's very capable. It's amazing that we have everything like case manufacturing, bullet manufacturing, loading, packaging, everything under the same roof. The fact that you've got your own tool shop so you can make all of your own dies, make all of your own case, stretchy tools, whatever they're called, it's pretty awesome. It is really. I have to say one of the strengths is that our team is very dedicated. We, we really have passion to do this. Yeah. Is there a lot of hunters in there? Oh yeah, I, I'm a I'm hunter myself and a lot of the stuff, they are hunters. Actually, last week we had a bit of a problem because there's so many <laughs> hunters that, that we, we, we really did, needed to find, find a way to run certain machines. To opening a moose season. Yes, yes. That's, that's the thing. I believe it's really positive when we develop the product, when we run the production. There's always kind of like good context behind when, when you know how the product is used. Of course, it's, it's not a requirement to be a hunter, <laughs> that's, that's for sure, but, but sometimes it's, it gives a bit help and perspective on, on, on doing things, so. This afternoon, I think we're down in the testing tunnels. Kind of excited to see. I've never shot copper and lead next to each other. You know, it's something when, when you get there and see how much work, how much preparation it really requires. You can think it as a very simple product, but it's, it's crazy how much you need to actually do. We are dealing with rather, uh, I would say, challenging physics. There are a lot of things happening that are under high pressure, high temperature, high velocity consistency that it needs to be there it's it really needs to be there and even the smaller smallest changes they have huge impact to the end result that's that's really really the heart of the development if we if we think about the ballistics so so i'm really looking forward to it I don't know about you, but when buying ammunition in my life, I have just gone to a shop, bought the right caliber, checked zero, and then gone out hunting. I've been informed by these guys that that is not the right approach because all of these different projectiles are designed to do completely different things. So we've come to the normal testing tunnel. It's 100 meter range. Up there, we have a test action test barrel in a vise so that we're not testing our own accuracy. And down here, we have a high speed camera and we're gonna put blocks of ballistic gel. We have four different bullet heads and we are going to try them. It's gonna be cool. Apparently, we're gonna see massively different results. I say apparently, we're gonna see different results. And I'm gonna get an education as to what the appropriate bullet is for the appropriate species and why. Before we could shoot gel, we checked point of impact so we could ensure a perfect center strike on the gel block. We've measured it, we've raised the table up, we've checked the serial on the gun with all the bullets. Let's rock and roll. A stringent safety procedure is followed before and after each shot. One single round fired and we headed down range to see the results. We headed down what range to see the results. See? Really expanded bullet and uh, weight of 50, 60 percent. We start to see if we find it in the trap. That is a... One strike. Yeah, this is Perfect. a good one. 
a lot of weight left in the bullet that was bonding keep the retained weight of the of the bullet okay. on a really good way okay so it's a good controlled system yeah what are we looking at here if you look here you can see a penetration about two centimeters three mm -hmm. then expansion starts and you get a quick fast aggressive expansion in the, in the block uh, lead fragments but uh, it's not much because of the bonding of the bullet so this the whole point in gel is to replicate an animal yeah and this is your wound cavity yeah essentially so this would be maximum energy delivery in the, in the center of the animal so you okay. get maximum effect of the of the shot that was bond strike time for eldx eldx is a non-bonded bullet so we'll expand in a less predictable way on impact although this can be good for varmint applications Predictable expansion is clearly desirable when pursuing large edible mammals. And nothing here. And that's just where it's hit the block and yeah, turned. and turned up. It's a little bit uh, lottery if it keeps together or goes. There's no you, you consistency. Get a, no, you get the separation between the core and the lead. This is the first time I'd seen the comparison of bonded and non-bonded bullets and the differences really intrigued me. You see the bullet lose more uh, of the weight inside the, yep. the animal or, or the block. Most of the expansion seems to have happened earlier. It's a less a consistent quicker, channel. And uh, if you compare the blocks, you can see you have much more fragment in this one. So the bullet goes in part. But there is a place where non-bonded bullets are better, I guess, for foxing, coyote. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, where you want it, lots of damage, yeah, this yeah. is great. But if you're looking for just a good bleed out yeah. with less meat yeah, damage. For meat you should eat. I, I prefer a, a bonded bullet, so it's not so much scrap in the, or lead in the, in the animal. Do you get more consistent exit wounds? Yeah. With a bonded with bullet a bonded as well? With a bonded bullet, yeah, because for you're sure. Because if we shot 10 of these, they'd look similar. If we yeah. shot 10 of these, it's a lottery. Yeah, a little bit of a lottery, yes. Because that first bullet had turned on impact, we fired another ELDX into another block so we could see the result. As you can see, the copper and lead had separated. Although as I was told, this is a lottery. Anything can happen when a non-bonded bullet strikes its target. Before running the same tests with the tip strike bullet in 223, the guys showed me round the rest of the testing facilities. Here is our hand loading room. So every new load you develop, you start working it in by hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a sample from the bullet department. And that just comes straight from the factory? Directly from the machine. And this set uh, from box 50. Which machine? It's a 30 Project caliber bomb strike. So that's a good one, I think. So you're should. gonna load that, you'll load that here. That's more or less exactly what we've just shot. It's the same. We hand load them. Here I have prepared 306 bomb strike. So the cases are filled with powder and I have the tool. How often are you running a test batch? Around uh, every third box of bullets. Okay. So at least one test uh, for uh, 15,000 manufactured bullets. So this is for the purposes of testing accuracy of this batch of bullets? Yes. So we start the system. Electronic range? Yeah. All of the common calibers are just set up yeah, here, ready yeah. to go? Yeah, the, the normal. We know what they are running in the production, so okay. we try to prepare as much as we can. We measure the center of the two worst, and this is uh, 11.8 millimeters. Uh, that's that's within tolerance. Yeah, this is in tolerance. Up to an inch okay. is maximum on this one. And that's just for your hunting ammunition. Yes. 
and uh, you can see the velocity at the muscle and with the target. 11 millimeters at 100 meters is incredibly accurate. It's good, yeah. But I, I guess you could tune it in a little more if you hand loaded for your rifle precisely. Yeah, if you make something with a cartridge length or something like that, you, maybe you can find another millimeter, but... Uh, I feel like that's yeah. not bad, center to center. No, no, is it under two calibers of the, of the bullets? I think most hunters probably aren't as good as that vice. Mm, no. For years, Norma used the VMAX heads, but because of supply chain issues over the last few years, they developed their own. It's called the Tip Strike. It's a rapid expanding head, and we're gonna shoot another gel block and see what a bullet that's designed for rapid expansion looks like. That's different. Yeah, it's something else. Here we have a warming bullet, or close to a warming bullet. You can see the really fast expansion of the of the bullet or fragmentation. Yeah. And everything is done within six inches. Yeah. From a technical perspective, how do you make a bullet do that? It's a, a thin jacket on the bullet okay. and a, a big hole in the behind the tip. That's that's it. Yeah. So. Easy to open, and of course, high speed. Theoretically, a lightweight, fast 223 with a bonded bullet would make it all the way through the block. Yeah. I feel like a bit of an idiot for just buying <laughs> the coolest looking box. Yeah, but uh, you should buy the bullet uh, of the purpose, or yeah. what animal, animal you should have. I mean, that really does just tear apart, doesn't it? And by the time it stops, there's not much left. So what, you're looking at 30% retention, 20% yeah. retention? Yeah, something like that. Wow. The difference between that and the 308 is pretty wild. I mean, they're different calibers, but just the difference in bullet and how they perform in the gel is really interesting. It's something that's very new to me. It's something I've always understood, but completely disregarded. Just because we're here and we've got more gel, we're gonna shoot a VMAX 50 grain 223 and compare the bullet channels. So the only thing controlled about these bullets is the rate with which they expand. Thereafter, the way they're gonna expand and the way that those bullets are gonna tear apart, everyone's gonna be unique, right? But it's interesting to see how different they are. And I've been told that if we shot 10 each bullet channel, the shape will be similar, but the way that they tear apart, the way that the little pieces of bullet, the lead and copper will be placed will just change. What I really learned is don't shoot deer with varmint designed bullet heads. Up until now, I just knew from carcass damage and shot reaction that some bullets were not ideal for the task at hand. But I'll definitely be more conscientious with my bullet selection from here on in. Next up for testing was EcoStrike, a copper monolithic bullet. Something I now use for the majority of my hunting. This is the gel block from the copper shot. As you can see, you have a real spiral cut, and that's because you get complete controlled expansion with copper. The wings peel back in the way they're designed to. There's no lead core, so it's almost completely uniform. No remnants left in there other than that green polymer tip, and obviously, it's gone all the way through. Following this test was an interesting discussion on the future of copper ammo and how it may eventually fall into long, medium, and short range loads to get optimum expansion for each application. Education over, it was time for some fun. We spent a short while in Norma's museum, looking over some unique guns, some deactivated guns, and some modern sporting rifles. Before heading into the range for some serious recoil. We see now they're made, it's now time to have some fun. So we've come to the testing range. We bought three different guns of various sizes. The smallest is a 3006, an M1 Garand, timeless classic. From there we go significantly bigger. We got a 460 Weatherby Magnum. That's gonna hurt quite a bit. And if that wasn't enough, a 505 Gibbs, invented in 1911 for shooting big game. This is going to be a lump. Let's go. Yeah. 
shoot the ground. It's as cool as they come. Super smooth. One of the best battle rifles ever made. Well, I'll, I'll do. I'll shoot one. Yeah. Well, they they come in eights. Four sixty Weatherby mag. These are loaded here by Norma in Sweden. That is a four hundred and fifty grain hollow point. This is going to be painful through a relatively lightweight rifle. The whole point in this caliber is, is a large game caliber that fits into a bolt action magazine rifle. Because it's rimless. There it goes. Uh -oh. I need a moment to myself. <laughs> I mean, I didn't really prepare myself. I just kind of got in and pulled the trigger. Just had to get it out of the way. But I took my glasses off just in case I punched myself in the face. And that was... That was quite a big boom. And I hit the paper. And it stands out like a sore thumb on that paper. That's epic. I don't think I'd want to like shoot one of those on the regular. I don't think I could afford to shoot one of those on the regular. Now for fun, we're going to watch a small Swedish man shoot it. Carl. Some big guns are quite a nice, slow, progressive boom, aren't they? A 375 is a really pleasant. The barrel just flies up in the air, doesn't it? You wouldn't be quick to reload, would you? Do Stalin make a 460 <laughs> moderator? <laughs> that's me and that's you. You first? Okay. I've never felt safer than I feel right now. Which is good, because we've got a CZ 550 Magnum here in 505. Gibbs with a 540 grain solid. Nothing about this is going to be fun until it's done. Here it goes, nothing. In some ways, it's better than the Weatherby, but not in many. <laughs> the overall effect is way more brutal. Well, successfully created a flinch, learned a lot about bullets and ruined my rifle shooting for life. Hey, we're four inches to the left at 20 yards, we'll take that. We'll probably learn to shoot it with a lot of training and a bit of gun fitting. I quite kind of want to do that again. That was awesome. Put this into perspective, this 505 Gibbs takes an entire 306. He gobbles it up and there's plenty of room left for more. Apparently we've got to shoot some more now. There's some skittles to shoot. Good old fashioned game of Norma five pin bowling. Apparently it's got to be done with a 505. <laughs> got to go to a hit one apparently, yeah? Yes. Hey, I think I need a sit down. Hey, that is like being in a car crash. I don't know much. Out of all the things we're going to get shot with, and we have had that discussion a lot over the last couple of days, is what's the worst caliber to get shot by? I think this could be the one. We were having a conversation about how hydrostatic shock actually does a huge amount of the damage when all of that pressure builds inside your body almost instantaneously. When you saw that jelly do this, you kind of understand. And I'd like to shoot a jelly block with this, providing I don't have to, um... Yeah, shoot it. That was amazing. I won't forget that experience in a hurry, and neither will my body. This was my first trip to a rifle ammunition factory, and it opened my eyes to a whole world of information that I kinda know about but never truly appreciated. From learning about how bullets were made, to how each load is developed, everything fascinated me. And I can't wait to carry on down this rabbit hole for years to come. My thanks to Norma for showing us round and sharing their knowledge so freely. And thanks to you for sharing this adventure with me. Take care guys, and we'll see you next time. 
thank you for watching guys this channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors you can find out more about them in the description down below and if you want to support the channel you can join as a member you get loads of extra content well some extra content and occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group if you don't feel like joining today we really appreciate you watching and subscribing have a wonderful day Och började att hålla föredrag för för dag En naven var i faria Gaben fanns som sagt Nu strider för den starka som har blivit svag